I lost my random thoughts. Uh, some people uh, believe that uh, when you get saved, what has really been accomplished is that you are now ready to die. Isn't that what you always understood? When you get saved, we are now ready to die. But the truth of it is that when you get saved, you're now ready to live. And it's the first day of the rest of your life, and it will last for all eternity. And it should be sweeter as the days go by. And as we were singing that song, though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all the way. And I was thinking about that and trying to relate that to my own heart. And I discovered while we were singing that verse that if if we're walking with Jesus as we as we can and as He wants us to, there never is a darksome path. There just isn't any such thing. It is sunshine all the way. Really is sunshine all the way. You believe that? And and uh, there seems to be so much misery in Christianity, and there's so much unhappiness. And you say, well, you look in the Bible, all of God's people suffered. Of course they suffer, and I suffer too, and we're all suffering. Everybody in the body of Christ is suffering. And uh, every saint of God in this world is suffering. But there's some words that I don't know how to explain. Like Paul said, he rejoiced in his suffering. He gloried in his tribulations. He took pleasure, he said, in his reproaches. And anything that gives you pleasure and joy and a source of glory or a source of boasting can't be bad. And these were things he related not to the sunshine days of his life, but he related these to the dark days of his life. And he says, they, those were the days out of which sprung his great joy, his future source of boasting, his pleasure. And uh, no use to say, well, I'm not the Apostle Paul, because you are. You're, uh, the Apostle Paul wasn't uh, one grade of Christian and you're another. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian. And if you're saved, you're saved just like Paul was saved, and you have as much as he had, and you know as much as he know, knew. In fact, I made this statement different times and raised his eyebrows, but I'll say it again. We know more than the Apostle Paul knew. Now, I'm going on that by this simple observation that the only thing that I know that Paul knew, he wrote in the Bible. But the, uh, the Spirit of God has continued for 19 centuries to unfold the height and depth and length and breadth of these things that he knew and to tell us many, many, many things that Paul didn't write down on the paper to pass on to us. I don't mean by that that We've been told things contradictory to what Paul wrote down on his paper. I'm just saying that the Holy Spirit continually tells us the largeness of what he wrote and gives us the fullness and the depth of what he said. And uh, we're the recipients of everything he knew as well as everything that the Holy Spirit has revealed to all the saints for 1900 years. And so you don't lack anything. You ought to experience what he experienced and know what he knew and have what he had. And uh, Romans 5, I was reading and enjoying recently, enjoying very much, and I'll just throw this in. Uh, Paul opens it by saying, therefore, which is kind of now a, a plateau he's arrived at in the book of Romans, and he's going to look backward now upon what he's taught in the first four chapters and uh, draw some conclusions, tie the loose ends together and, and put into one big statement what he's been saying here for four chapters. And he says this, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice 
in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, who is given unto us. And uh, if you look at this passage very carefully for your own benefit, you'll find that those who have been justified by faith have every reason to have peace and have every reason to have joy and have every reason to glory uh, in tribulation. Uh, you know what it means to be justified? It's a precious thing. Therefore, being justified, not shall be, but we are now. Being justified, you're justified if you're saved. And justification has two sides to its coin. And one side is probably the one we look at the most. And it means sins forgiven. And we dwell a lot on that. It means the canceling of a debt that's really owed. It means to be redeemed be bought back from bondage or to have a debt paid off that you really owe it means to be set free from the penalty that's a part of justification but that's only half of it Jesus did this at the cross and he did it by standing for me in regards to sin at the cross he took his place in the presence of God in my behalf and for me. That's the substitutionary atonement. He answered to God for all my sins as though it were myself answering to God for all my sins. He faced God and God's judgment and God's law and God's penalty as though I were standing there facing God's judgment and God's law and God's penalty. And in standing at the cross for me, in the presence of God, he satisfied God and redeemed me and set me free. Let me go. That's half of it. But that, you see, only has to do with his death. And that's only part of the good news. It's not simply that he died for me, but also that he was buried and that he was raised again. So the other part of the good news is that after he stood for me at the cross and faced God in death and was buried in a second death and descended into hell and propitiated God for all that stood against me, then God raised him and being raised from the dead, he was received into glory. And when God received him into his presence, he brought his precious blood with him, sprinkled the mercy seat as the evidence of an eternal redemption. But then God did something for him. God seated him at his right hand and gave him the glory which he had before the foundation of the world and called him his righteousness. And so the other half of justification is he was raised again for our justification. That is, when he was seated in the glory, he is now seated there, standing before God, if you want to put it that way, for me as my righteousness. At the cross he stood for me for sin. But now at the throne he stands for me for righteousness. And do you realize that Christ is still acting in my behalf in the presence of God just as he acted in my behalf in the presence of God at the cross. And in the book of Romans, <clears throat> Paul clearly states the great, wonderful truth 
that justification is not only being freed from the penalty of sin, it not only means to be redeemed from the power of sin and loosed from all of its penalty and its curse, but it means also to be acquitted of all guilt. It means also to have all the charges dropped. It means to have perfect righteousness counted or reckoned to you. It means that just as God put to the account of the Lord Jesus your sins, past, present, and future, don't ever forget, just as he put to the account of the Lord Jesus your sins, he also in his resurrection put to your account Christ's righteousness. That's precious. Do you believe Jesus died for you? Do you believe that he lives for you? That's what that means. That doesn't mean that when you say, he lives for me, that means that he's way off in the sky someplace, and because he lives up there, that means that after I die, there'll be a resurrection, I'll get to heaven. That isn't what it means. Just as he died for you once, he dies, the book of Hebrews tells us, no more. But he lives after the order of Melchizedek, a priest forever. And as he stands there before the throne of God forever, standing, not literally, but as his standing before the throne is forever, so is your righteousness forever. So is your standing in the presence of God forever. And you see, none of this has anything to do with what you did, what you are doing, or what you're going to do. It has nothing to do with what you promise not to do. It has nothing to do with what you fail to do or what you achieve. It has nothing to do with your relationship to an organization. It has nothing to do with your relationship to me. It has nothing to do with anything in this world. It has to do with the Lord Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit and what they did in the covenant of Calvary. And that's the only gospel that I know. And it's the only gospel that I preach. I can't preach another because I don't know another. And I tell you this, I dare to believe it. I dare to believe it because God says that it's so. So therefore, I told you I wasn't going to preach. Being justified by faith. That's how you get it. That's how it becomes a reality to me. It becomes a reality to me when I believe it. It becomes a reality to me when I believe that God told me the truth when he said this is the way it is. And someday maybe we'll have time to go into what it means to believe. Uh, Brother and I were talking about it the other day. He, we were kicking around the question, what, does, what are we really saying to the unsaved when we uh, tell him to believe? And we got to discussing the ridiculous idea of going out here and telling the sinner what to do in order to be saved. And the answer came up in the conversation. Well, the jailer said to Paul, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's what Paul said to the jailer when he asked the question, What shall I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And and uh, I said, well, you know, it depends on how you hear that. I don't know what inflection Paul had in his voice when he said that, but I can say that to you and give you some different understanding of it. If you ask me, what must I do to be saved? I would say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as though I were saying, go ahead, do it if you can. Can you do it? No, you can't do it. Faith is the gift of God. 
we say, then what's the use in telling anybody to do it if they can't do it? Anybody can do it who wants to do it, but they can't do it on their own. That faith is a gift of God, and you can't command somebody to start believing. Belief or faith comes by hearing, and the hearing is of the Word of God. And you'll read following Paul's discussion with the jailer, and so he took him and he taught him the Word of the Lord. And in, in the giving of the Word of the Lord to this jailer, faith was born. We have the idea that the jailer dropped down right there on his face and said, I'm a Christian. But what followed was that Paul took him privately and he taught him the word of the Lord because he wanted to hear. Because I have an idea that when he said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the jailer said, thanks for nothing. Because that's something I can't do. I don't know anything about Jesus for one thing. And what's to believe? But let me tell you exactly how you get justified. You get justified by believing what God says about Jesus. That's exactly how you get justified. Well, that implies, of course, that you have to hear what God says about Jesus. So how shall they believe without hearing, and how can they hear without somebody preaching, and how can somebody preach without them being sent? So it implies you have to hear from somebody what God has to report. And what he has to say, and what he has to say is good news. And here's the good news. I'm not mad at you. I don't hate you. I'm not going to put you in hell. I'm not going to hold you accountable for your sins. I love you. Your sins are paid for. I'm not mad at you. You're reconciled to me. I want you to come and live with me. And I want to come and live with you. That's the good news. I know you're naked. You don't have to hide anymore behind the trees in the garden, and you don't have to wear your fig leaves anymore. I know who you are. I know where you are. I know all about you, and I've made every provision for you. Come now. Come now. Be reconciled to me. Well, what do you want me to do? I don't want you to do anything. Well, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do about all my sins? There's nothing to do about it. I've already done something about it. Well, Lord, I'm bad. I know. That's why I had to do this. But what do you want me to say? Try thank you. Well, what will this cost, Lord? Nothing. It's free. Well, that's grace, Lord. Yeah, that's what I call it, too. <laughs> grace. You mean I don't have to do anything in return? Nothing. Well, what do you want me to be? Nothing. Believe me, and I will make you everything you need to be. I'm, I'm compelled to ask you this. How many of you really believe that salvation is that simple? You really believe that? I believe that. And I'll tell you this, that if it's not that simple, there ain't going to be anybody in heaven. There won't be a soul there. Not a soul. If you don't get there that way, you won't get there. Because if you don't get there that way, then there will be something you will have to do and if there's something you will have to do, first of all, you will spend your entire lifetime trying to find out what it is. Because as many different people as you meet will tell you as many different things to do in order to be saved. So you have to run through all of them and see if you get any results. And that'll take you a lifetime. And you'll run out of life long before you track down that elusive answer. The one thing I have to do in order to be saved. And secondly, if you did perchance stumble on to whatever it is you would have to do to be saved, and you felt assured in your heart that you had discovered the right thing to do, you would spend the rest of your life trying to do it consistently. 
I was in a place of business the other day, and I was looking at some items for sale. And uh, there were two men on the other side of the counter from me. It was just a gondola type thing in the store, and I was on this side, and they were on the other side. And I noticed they were engaged in a very earnest conversation. <coughs> and uh, I wasn't really eavesdropping, but I couldn't help but hear through the gondola, and I wanted to anyway. <laughs> and so first thing I noticed was that they were having a religious discussion, and religious was really what it was. One of them was an older man, and one of them was a younger man. And... Uh, I couldn't get the gist of what they were saying, but just as I got ready to walk away, I heard the older man drive his point home. And he said, well, I'll tell you what I told him. I told him it's just like this, that I'm going to live my life the best I know how, and I'm going to do the best I can, and I try, I try to, to go to church and take my part and carry my responsibility. And uh, he said, if I, if, I, if I should happen to do some sin before I die, uh, I don't want them to sit around after my funeral and say, well, he wasn't a Christian to the end. Because I'll tell you, you know, you don't know what happens in a man's heart just before he dies. And I'd ha I might have I confessed that sin and got right with God. So he said, I don't think we ought to judge anybody to see whether they're a Christian or not. And I thought, how typical of people who have never heard the good news. I was at a convention of preachers one time years ago. And a uh, man told me, a preacher from Indiana told me, that the only way he knew that a man would be in heaven for sure the only way he could speak with absolute assurance about anybody's salvation was to know that while he was at an altar of prayer confessing his sins, God struck him dead. Can you believe that? Now this man preaches this to hundreds of people every Sunday. And those people sit there and lap it up and go out and try a little harder to hold out faithful and to keep on doing whatever it is God wants them to do and be whatever it is God wants them to be. That's the story of religion is do and be. And we're caught up in doing and caught up in being, trying to be what God wants us to be by doing what we think God wants us to do. And the truth of the gospel is that everything that I need to do, Jesus did. And everything that I need to be, Jesus is. And he is mine. That's all the gospel there is in this book. Everything I need to do has been done. And everything I need to be is already perfect and seated in the presence of God. And that's the Lord Jesus. Therefore, being justified by faith, We ought to have peace with God. We have it. We have it. We are the only people in the world who have peace with God. Everybody else thinks they have it, but we have it. I'm not talking about we. I'm not talking about we in the union hall or we listening to the tapes. I'm talking about we who have been justified by faith, whoever we are. We have it. Everybody else hopes to have it. Everybody longs for it. Everybody wishes for it. But we have it. We have it. We have peace. And the Greek says that we have peace facing God. And I, I see two things in that. One is that I can look into the face of God and have peace. That's one side of it. And the other side of it is that Jesus is my peace and he is facing God now this moment for me that as he faced him at the cross for me he now faces him at the throne for me and standing there facing God is my peace that's my peace standing there 
And that's the reason why, of all the hymns that I've sung in my lifetime, one that tells my heart more than any I know is that song that says, This is all my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Is that what you can sing? Yeah. That's all I know. That's all I want to know. Because I'm satisfied, fulfilled, completed, joyful, peaceful. And I glory in this gospel. It's something to boast in. Only my God could save men like that. My God is the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified, therefore, by faith, I, I have to emphasize this again, we have peace facing God. And this is through our Lord Jesus Christ, and I just explained to you how it is through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not through anything that I've done, not through anything that I am, not through anything that I've accomplished or hope to accomplish, not through anything that I've promised God, not through any of my performance. It's through a person, by means of a person. And don't you see that my standing with God, my peace facing God, has to do with a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because I have this peace facing God, through and by this same person, I have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That is, that I have a permanent and eternal access into this state of favor, been brought there by the Lord Jesus. The word access in the original language is best translated by the French word entree. It means more than just to get inside. It means more to just go through the door. It means to be ushered in. It means to be brought in. It means to be received with honor and with glory and with dignity. Do you understand the word? Now, the water meter man has access to my house because he was there the other day to read a meter. But uh, he didn't get any access like I'm talking about. I didn't roll out any red carpet. And I didn't fall upon his neck when he entered in the door. I didn't take him into every part of my home. In other words, he got to read my water meter, but uh, he didn't get to me. The so Lord Jesus, this same grace wherein we stand, has given us this kind of an entrance to God, into his grace into his favor. He brought us into divine favor. Not only did he bring us into divine favor by his work, he brought us into the divine presence by entering there himself and being received with honor and glory and dignity and seated and clothed and accepted. And because all of this was done for him, God did it literally for us because he came there not representing God when he came to the throne. He came to the throne representing me. He went to the cross not representing God. He went to the cross representing me. He went to the cross as my mediator, my intercessor. And he went to the throne as my advocate, as my priest. Priest is on man's side and he's on my side. And when God received him like that, he received me. And whatever place Jesus holds in the heart of God, I hold that same identical place. Whatever standing God has in the presence of God, I have that same identical standing. Whatever glory God has given to him, he has given to me. Whatever riches are his, are mine. Whoever he is, whatever he is, and whatever he has, are one and the same as myself. Because I've been joined to him. 
bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And this miracle takes place through the power of faith, faith worked in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. For as we hear the word of God, we are forced to a decision. I don't think it's a decision that you make, you know, at 10.09 in the morning or 12.32 in the evening. It's a decision, it's a conclusion that we come to in our hearts over a period of time. But as we hear the record which God has given, I've reported it to you this morning in essence, we come to a settled persuasion that what God says is true, or we come to a settled persuasion that what he says is not true. And when we come to a settled persuasion that what he says is not true, we are just as much filled with unbelief as the believer is filled with faith. An evil heart of unbelief, God calls it in the book of Hebrews. It doesn't do any good for you to say that you believe it. Where the rubber meets the road, the bottom line, is whether the effects of it are in your life. Now, the religious world turns this around, you know. <clears throat> and they say, <clears throat> because, the, because the fruit is in my life, then God saves me. God saves me when my life is as he wants it to be. But when God saves you, your life becomes what he wants it to be. You don't have anything to do with it. Not a thing in the world. It, it doesn't do you any good, I repeat, to say that you believe this unless the practical effect of it is in your life. Now, what is that practical effect? What is that? Well, if we have been justified, and if we have peace with God, and if we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, there ought to be some rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. There ought to be some glory in tribulation, which is an old-fashioned word for pressure. There ought to be some patience worked in us that produces experience and experience that makes hope a reality to us every day in our lives. A hope that never is disappointed and a hope that is never, never confounded or put to the blush. And along with it, the love of God poured in and then filled to overflowing and running out by the Holy Ghost who is given unto us. I'm going to, um, one day, <clears throat> I have a message on the back burner. It's been there for a long time. I've got three back there. And I'm going to have to get rid of one of them because it's simmered so long now, I don't know what's going to happen to it. I want to bring a message someday on Christian idolatry. That's going to come up before long. And really, these three messages I'm talking about are all tied together. One of them is Christian idolatry. And the other, I don't really know what to call it, but it's on the subject of man's incurable tendency to be as God. It goes back to the Garden of Eden. Ye shall be as God, Satan says. And man has tried to be God ever since. And, and the third message, which will be <clears throat> probably come up first, and I, I decided after a lot of thought that I'm going to call it... Um, Discovered, discovered, discovered reality. Because reality is truth. Truth is the state of things as they really are. Not as I want them to be, not as I hope for them to be, not as I think they should be or could be, but as they are. Reality is you sitting here on these metal chairs at two minutes to eleven on Sunday morning. You may not want to be here, but this is where you are. You may wish you were someplace else, but you're here. Your thoughts may be someplace else, but that's only an escape from reality. Reality is right here. This is where you are. 
and reality is truth, and truth is Jesus. So you play with that. When you accept reality, who are you accepting? When you walk in reality, who are you walking in? When reality shapes your life, who shapes your life? And the reason I've been thinking about this reality business a lot is fits in with what we're talking about here from Romans. The Christian world says they have peace. They say they have joy. They say they have hope. They say they glory in their tribulations and they say they, they know that they work patience. And they say they have the love of God. They say all these things. Say is a big word. You might even call it a saying religion because they are always saying these things. And if you'll let that little word sink in, it will probably bring you back eventually to the book of James, where James continually says, If a man say, but thus and so be not true, and then he'll bring you to John's epistles, If a man say, he have no sin, thus and so is true. So there's a lot of saying religion even back in John's day and in James' day, and there's more of it today. Now, there is, there is a thing. This is part of a message I'm giving you a preview. We'll switch from uh, the religious world now to the scientific world. And uh, what you have in the scientific world, you have two things. You have scientific fact. And then you have an interpretation of those facts, which becomes scientific theory or a hypothesis. Right Now, where all the difficulty comes in is <clears throat> we have too many professors <clears throat> in college and, and around the world and too many scientists who teach their interpretation of facts as though that interpretation was the fact. You with me? The reality is the fact. A million people may interpret the fact a million different ways, and you have a million different philosophies of the fact, but that isn't reality. Reality is the fact, and the reality never changes. You may not ever get to it, but it'll always be there. You may not understand it, but it will never change. You may not like it, but it will never go away. It will be there forever and ever and ever and ever, and Jesus is the fact of all life. He's the reality. He's the truth. You may not like him, but he won't go away. You may never come to him, but he will always be there. Jesus is that fact, and he is that reality. Now, in the religious world, you have the same situation as you have in the scientific world. You have a lot of preachers and theologians, and uh, when I say that, I know you, you think that I'm referring only to the ministry, and that gets you off the hook. Every man that has religion is a preacher and a theologian. Whether he has a formal pulpit or not doesn't make any difference. But every man who has confessed Christianity, and that includes all you people in this hall, all you people listening to the tape, every man who has confessed Christianity has either one thing or the other. He either has the fact or he has his interpretation of the fact. He has the reality or he has his theory about the reality. And theories, you know, sound good, and they're convincing. And theories are weighty and powerful. Well, it's because they're built on reason. Line upon line and precept upon precept. So theories are hard to combat. And they give all the outward appearance of, of uh, having the fact. But theories aren't really any good until they are tested, tried. Now, my conclusion on that, this. A lot of people say this is their theory. This is their philosophy. This is their interpretation of fact. 
They say they have peace. They say they have joy. They say they have all of these things which are given in the New Testament as the fruit of New Testament salvation. But there isn't one of those people in a thousand who have ever had their theory put to any kind of a test. And my conclusion is that 99% of all professing Christians have 99% philosophy and maybe 1% reality if they're Christians at all. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. Example. <clears throat> I throw all my messages together this morning. I wanna, I'm cheating. I don't, I don't want to do this. You heard me mention these two words, chaos and cosmos. Cosmos is a word in the Greek which means divine arrangement, perfect order, a system, organization, I mean in its finest sense, highly organized, a divine system, a divine arrangement, everything in its place, everything working perfectly together for good. Isn't that wonderful? God's perfect order, cosmos. The opposite of that word in the Greek is the word chaos, which we carry over in English. And everybody knows what chaos is. I mean, chaos in my life. Chaos in the world. Now, man, because of sin, has a heart that is in chaos, disorder, right? It's out of order. His heart's out of order. And, and the, the fruit of that, as I see it, as I look around, is man's insatiable desire to set his life in order. So he goes to work on the outer circumstances of his life. He goes to work in the outer man and he he has he has this thing about getting his life in order and keeping it in order and not only that it goes from getting his life in order and keeping it in order but getting his things in order and keeping his things in order and I see it in myself sometimes when I arrive at a point where I don't think that I can I can think another thought or do another thing until I just suddenly stop and clean my desk you ever do that can't desk is piled high, I know where everything is, and I can lay my hand right on it, but suddenly I get this insane thing that I've got to take everything off my desk, sort it all out, stack it all up, put it in neat piles, put it in some kind of orderly arrangement, and when I do I can never find anything, but put it in every kind of an orderly arrangement. I get it all, women do this, they empty the closets out in the middle of the floor suddenly one day, or dump all the dresser drawers out in the floor, I've got to put it all in order, put the same stuff back in. And they put it back in the same drawers. But somehow when they finished, same thing with spring and fall house cleaning, you know. Somehow when they finished, there's some kind of a satisfaction and a peace in knowing that everything's in order now. Everything is in some system. Everything is, is in a proper fashion now. Are you with me? I'll give you another little psychological test, you know. You, you suddenly get unhappy with your car uses too much gas and, and the tires are bad and it needs a new muffler and, and the upholstery is torn up and everybody else has got a new car and, and so forth and so on. Now I'm so unhappy with this old bucket of bolts and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going, I'm just going to trade it in. And then you go down and, and you talk trade and when the man tells you how much money he wants, why you decide, well, I can't afford it right now. So on your way home, you stop the car wash and you run it through the car wash. <clears throat> and you come out and it's amazing. Runs better than ever ran before. Beautiful. Uh, suddenly you've got it in some kind of an orderly fashion here now. Well, I never saw this car like this. Got a new perspective altogether. Everything's in order. I can just go another little while now with my old car. And uh, there's this thing. Man has chaos down inside. And like the sheep who are astray, we turn to our own way consistently. And we have this drive to consistently get things in order and keep them in order. Not only get them in order, keep them in order. And that's where our desire to be like God comes in. Only He can create cosmos and only He can maintain it. 
A man shuffles everything around in the outer circumstances of his life in hopes that he will escape from the chaos which he has down inside. When he can lay down at night, his house is clean, all his clothes are folded and in their right place, his car is parked in the driveway, all his bills are up to date, health prevails, his job is going fine, everything in his kingdom is in perfect order, he lays down at night and he says, Thank you, Lord, I have peace and I have joy. And I have all these things that are the evidences and the proofs of the Christian life. And the Christian life is an established cosmos in the heart forever by the work of Jesus Christ. But I tell you this. When I said that most Christians have 99% theory and 1% reality if they have any at all, I throw it out to you. Every one of you people in this hall this morning are living in more or less a controlled environment. Right? You're moving within a perimeter wherein you probably feel reasonably safe and secure. Your friends are there and your family's there and your things are there and your job is there and this is there and that's there. And, and I just throw this out to you. Do you have peace because there is an orderly arrangement to your life? Or do you have peace facing God because of Jesus Christ, even though your life may be in chaos? And I'll just tantalize you a little bit more. How can you be sure? What are you really sure of? Whatever you're sure of, that's reality. That's reality. I'll tell you who you are and what you are. If God would suddenly reach down in this hall this morning and pick you up by your bootstraps, just jerk you right straight up in the air and transplant you 5,000 miles on this planet, and set you down in an environment that was 180 degrees turned around from what you know right here. That's who you would be and what you would be and what you would have of peace and joy and all that other good stuff left would be the only reality you ever possess. That's all. Because peace and joy and all these good things that go with the Christian life have nothing to do with circumstances. They have nothing to do with people. They have nothing to do with things. They have to do with Jesus Christ. And you have him or you don't have him. And I said my message would be entitled Discovered Reality. And I'm going to title it that because... Many of us are saved, and we have Jesus, and that's the fullness of reality. Most of us haven't discovered much of him. Discovered reality, I'm going to call it, because I think some of you have reality, and you yourself don't even know that you have it. You ought to be enjoying it. Well, what's to preach now? I want to give you one example. <clears throat> and I'd probably like to go into it some other time in depth. I wonder how much reality Job knew he had in the beginning of his experience. Job was described uh, in the beginning of his experience as being a wealthy man, very wealthy man. Described as being a highly esteemed man, respected man. Family man, big family. And an adoring family. Every day they met together and offered sacrifices together. And every day Job prayed for his family. And, 
and uh, just you know you read over the first part of the first chapter of Job before his trouble started and you just write happy 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 over the whole page blessed 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 here's a man who surely his life could be described by the single word cosmos cosmos Yet you turn the page and you scratch out cosmos and you write chaos. Right? Chaos. As in one fell swoop. You notice I like that. I don't even know what it means. But in one fell swoop, his family's wiped out. His things are wiped out. His marriage is wiped out and his health is wiped out. Now, his marriage didn't get wiped out till all the other things started getting wiped out. And finally, his wife got honest for the first time in her life and she said, why don't you just curse God and die? We'll all be better off. She wanted to collect his social security and retire. <laughs> so you just write chaos over the man, can't you? And argue as you might like to. You can't get around the fact that God brought that chaos into his life. Did he not? Will you dare to say so? Did God bring that chaos in his life? Well, there's two schools of thought. Religion says the devil brought it. Faith says God brought it. Because, you know, God signed the order. And when it comes to taking responsibility, don't make any difference how many lackeys have something to do with it. It's the man that put his signature down there that verified the order. Right? You fellows who are in the service know that. Ain't no buck private gets the blame for anything. It's that man up there at the top. That man assigned his name to the order. That's the guy that carries the responsibility. Okay. Who signed the order? I ask you, who signed it? God did. Satan brought it for approval, didn't he? He said, here it is, Lord, this thing I want to do. This is the reason I make fun of him. But he, he's, so, he's phonier than 30 cents. I thought I was phony. He is the king of the phonies. You know why he's king of the phonies? He's the servant of God, and he has convinced the whole world he's God. And he's got them thinking that God is his servant. He says, God only does what I like to do. And God says, Satan only does what I like to do. Now, you can believe me or you can believe him, but I believe God. God's the boss. He's my boss, and he's Satan's boss, too. And uh, this is a pun. One of these days, he's going to fire him. <laughs> One of these days, he's going to fire him. You fire people when their usefulness is what? Ended. When a person is of no longer benefit to you, you fire him. God will fire him one of these days, just as he's going to fire some of you. So say what you will, God ordered this chaos in his life. And chaos came into Job's life. I mean, in one day. I mean, he got up one Monday morning and it just looked like any other Monday morning to him. Sun was shining. The family was there at the breakfast table, and Mrs. Job was fixing, uh, you know, grits and eggs and sausage and stuff. And coffee was perking, and Job said, "Bring the Bible. We'll have our devotions like we've always had them on Monday morning." He opened the Bible, read a few verses of Scripture, and said, "Let's pray." And he prayed for his family, and they offered their usual sacrifices. So let's go on out the field like we've done many, many other Mondays, and me and the boys will go down and see about the cattle. And before nightfall. Chaos. Things gone. In a matter of time, days, things gone. Family gone. Wiped them out. Lightning done struck them. Fire come right down out of heaven. Devoured them. So this Christian man went back to his house and said, well... Lost all my kids, my in-laws. Lost all my possessions. But I'll tell you one thing, I got God. And I got my health. And I got my wife. And I guess I got peace. 
And before long, he got up and he found out he had cancers all over his body, terminal. And uh, the last straw was his wife came out on the garbage pile where they drug him and dumped him outside the city to die. And he was sitting out there with broken pieces of pottery, scraping a runny, ulcerous, cancerous sores on his body. And she came out and said, I have a message for you. Why don't you just curse God and die? Because damn, my God would do anything like this. That's religion. That's religion. You read about the phoenix, haven't you? They came back from the ashes. Job came back from the ashes. He's God's original phoenix. Because in the ashes, he got to the bottom line. And he sorted things out. And lo and behold, he found out that he had reality that he didn't know he ever possessed. He discovered some reality that he didn't know was ever there. And when he came back from that place, you remember God restored him. Gave him twice as much as he had to begin with. He had a bigger family than he ever had. I assume from that he got the family of God in exchange for his earthly family. But he had a bigger family than he ever had, better health than he ever had, more money than he ever had, more esteem than he ever had. I don't know what all he got, but he got, according to the Scriptures much more than he ever had before. In other words, his latter state was better than his first, wasn't it? You can't knock that no matter you know, how many bumps and bruises it took to get there. But he ended up in better shape than he was before. But the thing he got of value was not the things that were restored to him. What he got of value was the reality that he discovered. And I say that when Job came out of his pit... For the first time in his life, he wasn't ready to die. He was ready to live. He didn't fear man nor beast. And he didn't fear tomorrow nor yesterday. He didn't fear time nor space nor matter. He didn't fear anything. He had reality. He had found out that God was absolutely all he had ever needed. Job could testify, I have peace with God. And if I'd have heard him say that after his experience, I said, Brother, I believe you really do. Man have to have it. You couldn't have made it any other way. But I have joy. I believe that, Job. You've convinced me. Well, then, you know, when I talk along this line, people say, My golly, that's horrible. I mean, that's the way God has to treat us? That's the way God has to deal with us? Bring reality in our life? No. He may never touch your health. You may live to be 90 years old and be robust and healthy till the day you die. You may have a happy home, a successful marriage, lots of riches in the bank, lots of friends, and all the things that people say are a part of being happy or whatever. God may never lay His hand on a thing like that. May never touch a single thing in your life. Never. But I'll tell you this. If you're saved, you count on this. He'll lay His hand on you. And He may not take your things away from you, but He may take you away from your things. See, you want to make sure how you talk to God. Make sure you get everything figured out before you go making requests because you might have left something out. He can take you away from your things. <laughs> How can He do that? Well, He can draw you unto Himself. And little by little, you, you look around and you say, the peace that I thought I had in things isn't even worthy of mention compared to the peace I have in the reality of knowing Him. I throw some questions out to you. How much peace would you have left tomorrow if you lost your job, your wife, or your husband, your children, and all your possessions in one day? How much joy would you have left? How much patience? 
How much hope? What would you have to glory in? What would you have to boast in? You'd have exactly the same amount of reality as you have this morning. Whatever that reality is, some of it awaits to be discovered. How much do you really have and how much are you sure you have? Now, Christians talk a lot about, I go as far as my peace will let me go, you know. Uh, I can't stay here anymore because I don't have peace about being here. Or I, I stay here because I have peace about being here. And, and I wonder if sometimes if that peace isn't directly related to the circumstances. I have peace here because these are circumstances that are desirable to me. And back now to cosmos and chaos. This is the orderly arrangement where I find peace. This is the habitat, the natural environment where I'm at rest. But that has nothing whatever to do with having peace with God and being at rest with Him. You believe that? Nothing whatever. You may have some kind of calmness, some kind of serenity, some kind of quietness that you enjoy in this particular set of circumstances because you adjusted all of these circumstances to produce a serenity and peace and quietness within you. That which agitates you, you've eliminated from your life. That which quiets you, you've added to your life. Now, I'm wondering if, if, if God, if just for a little experiment... You know, sometimes I wish I were either God or George Burns because this is what I could do. I could just reach out here and just take you one at a time. Reach out here and just pick you up like this, like you pick up, uh, you know, little puppies. Just pick you up like this. And first of all, put all the data concerning your life and your environment and your circumstances into my giant computer. And then have my computer design an environment and a set of circumstances 180 degrees turned around from where you are. Now just plop you down in there, like uh, dropping a lobster in a, in a kettle. Just plop you down in there. And, and I'd, I'd wait to hear what you had to say. When somebody said, well, brother, how are you? I'd, I'd wait to hear you say, I have peace. I have joy. Is that too much Christianity for you? Would you like to have some reality like that? It's there. Jesus is that reality. You know, I met a fellow the other day, and I'm meeting them all the time. Take your average independent, fundamental, premillennial, well-adjusted, soul-winning, Bible-reading, book, blood, blessed hope uh, type Christian. And every time you meet him, he's got a smile that goes from ear to ear like a mule eating thistles. He's got a pocket full of tracks. And uh, he's been out serving the Lord. He's on fire for God. And he's out there just reaping the blessings. And you know what I'm talking about? And I ran into one not long ago, you know. And it just, he just reaped of all of this. You know. And uh, I just couldn't help but wonder, you know. If you suddenly lifted him out of his Bible-believing, evangelical, premillennial, independent, fundamental church, and, and if you suddenly took his Bible away from him, and his pocket full of tracts, and took all his Christian brothers from around him, and his Christian family and his job and the stability of his place in this little world which he's carved out. Now, the reason man goes to work on his own life, putting it in the cosmos, in the orderly arrangement, is then he has peace inside because his life matches the cosmos of the world around him. Then he has been conformed or schemed together with the world around him. And that's what Paul says in Romans 12 too. Be not conformed, schemed together, fashioned like this world system. They tell you it's in cosmos. God says it's in chaos. 
And when you buck the chaos of this world, it will bring chaos into your life. You get with the cosmos of this world and you'll have some cosmos in your life. This is exactly what this book says. So when man gets saved, he's in trouble. The chaos inside is gone. And he is brought into the orderly arrangement, into the scheme, into the divine organization. You with me? He doesn't know all this, but this is what happens to him. Now conformed to a divine <coughs> arrangement and scheme and organization. <coughs> that organization, in this sense of the word, I'm speaking correctly, the body of Christ. And he doesn't realize it, but now as he goes out here in the world, he finds that the cosmos inside of him is creating a tremendous amount of friction in the chaos around him. And either he conforms to the chaos around him so to take off the outer pressure, and then he experiences chaos inside from the pressure of the inner man being not true to the reality he knows. And some of the verses of the Bible are understandable in this line of thought. The inner man renewed day by day, the outer man perishing. So, as, as I met this fellow the other day, and he reeked of all of this order, this divine arrangement in his life, I wondered how much of it he had really arranged. I wonder how much of the order the man himself had made and not God. And I wonder if he, if he made this order because it... it yielded its fruit of, of a certain kind of safety and peace and assurance and quietness. I sense it every now and then. I told you not long ago in a message, I sense it every now and then when, when I'm tired of the battle. And I drive by some nice, friendly church where the spotlights are up on the steeple and the bulletin board announcing the coming events and I see the parsonage and the security and the, the esteem and the acceptance of the man by the people and I look at all of it and I say, man alive. Boy, that would seem like heaven, you know, just to escape all the pressure and all the chaos by bucking the system and just kind of slip into the cosmos there. You with me? You've all felt the same way about going back to church every now and then, haven't you? It'd be easy to just kind of slip back in there. And, and uh, so every now and then I feel like coming out in me, you know. I think, my... Whew, boy, I could go down to post office in the morning and everybody in Belfry say, Good morning, Reverend Roush. And I could just smile like, you know, eating ice cream out of a churn and just love the greetings in the marketplace. All the people say, there goes a, a good man, best man, Belper. And that would bring a certain amount of cosmos into my life that I'd lack desperately. But oh, the chaos that would come in my heart. The chaos. You know why? Because down inside, I have cosmos. And they don't have anything to do with my circumstances. And they don't have anything to do with people. And they don't have anything to do with where I am or what I am in the eyes of others. It doesn't have anything to do with anything excepting my relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ and being placed in that divine arrangement where everything is in order. This is what the Scripture talks about. Everything is in order in the inner man. It's in its right place. Quietness. The work of righteousness is peace, the prophet said. And the effect of it is quietness and assurance forever. Isn't that a wonderfully quieting verse? Forever. You got chaos this morning? Take a look at uh, the way you're manipulating the circumstances of your life and see if you haven't traded the cosmos you once knew in your heart for the chaos by trying to create cosmos in your outer life. Okay, is that making sense to you? See what you lost in the bargain. See what you lost in the bargain. 
I know one thing, and I don't think I'll ever have to give this message because I just gave it. As I read this book, and I read it much, I see that the lives of the men and the women where God was glorified. I used to say things like the men that God used. And that's all right. That describes them after a fashion. But somehow we're so clergy, laity or oriented that when I say things like that, then we turn off, you know, so he's on talking about preachers. And when I see the, the ordinary individuals, the, the human beings in this book, where God was glorified in their life, where he was big and magnified in their lives, where they decreased and he increased. I see that they lived, uh, as far as the outer life was concerned, in utter chaos. All of them. Turbulent lives. Do you agree to that? And all I have to do is give you our great example. Our great example is Jesus. This man walked on this earth with perfect cosmos in his heart. Did he not? Perfect. And and it's like the the problem, you know, in the atomic structure of the universe, all of the atoms being arranged in the same order. That's what gives the feeling of solid to my hands, is because the atoms of my hand and the atoms of this desk, when I lay my hand down there, they're in the same order. So it's the space in the desk and the space in my hand that collides. With a slight change, I could pass my hand through the desk. And when you have cosmos inside and you go out into this chaotic world, there's a collision of forces. A collision of forces. And then the Christian weighs the possibility of adjusting his life to the pressure that's out there so that the collision isn't as great and thereby give himself a little rest and a little peace and thereby create for himself what God wants to create for him and thereby becoming his own God and thereby becoming more and more dependent upon himself and less and less dependent upon God. You know how we deal with life. We work the trouble spots out of our life. If anything agitates us, we get rid of the agitation. If anything bothers us, we get rid of the bother. If anything worries us, we get rid of the worry. We never think of doing anything less than manipulating everything in our lives to give to us what we consider to be peace, rest, joy, and all of these things which are the gift of God through Jesus Christ. We settle for the counterfeit, but the reality is there. A joy you don't ever have to conjure up. A joy that will be there whether it rains or the sun shines. It will be there whether you're broke or you're rich. Be there whether you're healthy or you're not healthy. Be there whether anybody loves you or whether nobody loves you. It'll be there whether you've got a place to, to lay your head at night or whether you don't have any place to lay your head at night. It'll be there whether you have friends or whether you don't have friends. That's the kind of joy that's real. That's reality, okay? The kind of works. And I see this in this book. I don't say that there weren't Christians in the New Testament that might not have had well-adjusted, uh, organized, systematic, properly arranged lives. But I don't read about any of them. And therefore, I conclude from that that God didn't think that their story was worthy of mention in his book. And if the New Testament were being written this morning in 1977, 99% of our lives wouldn't be worth mentioning in his book as an example to others. Right? You agree with that? How many of you would like to write your life testimony as an epistle to be carried out for 19 centuries to other believers to emulate? If you were all honest, you would say, hey, let somebody else who has a little more reality than I have put their story in there because if I were sending advice down over 19 centuries, I would say, get more reality than I've got. Isn't that what most of you would say? Search for more reality. Find more reality than I've known because I sense there's more out there. 
But I see that the lives that were worthy of mention were chaotic lives. Yet these men and women who lived them exhibited, demonstrated, walked in the reality of a cosmos within that no man could explain. Our great example, Jesus. My joy no man takes from me, he said. And then he mentioned peace. He said, peace I give unto you. And my peace I leave with you. There's one he gives and there's one he leaves, you know. The one he gave and the one he left. When he died at the cross of Calvary, he gave as a free gift to all who receive him peace with God. And that's what I'm talking about in my text. But he also left behind as a legacy and an inheritance a precious reality, I believe, what was his own personal peace in this world. You know what I'm talking about? Did he personally have peace? Or did he just preach about it like most of us do? Did he have it or did he just talk about it? Did he have the fact or did he have the interpretation? He had the fact. It was a reality to him. Peace. And he left that for you. Yet he walked the most chaotic life any man could ever walk. Did he not? But he didn't try. <laughs> it just happened that way. I have never seen any human being's life less manipulated by man than the life of Jesus. It was never manipulated by man. Never. Never was it manipulated by himself. He always said, I came to do my father's will. In every turbulence, he looked up and he said, Even so, Father, for it has seemed good unto thee. Never did he defend himself. He didn't need to. Never did he justify himself before men. He never had to. He just walked around demonstrating the reality of what all of Pharisee, Phariseeism preached, but never possessed. Now to get you killed... If you keep on doing it, believe me. That's my message, the Lord bless you.